It does, actually. It does. I remember when I was at D.C., when I just was, like, first editing, and I was in a building with a bunch of other editors, and we were all like a gang of editors. And you'd look at each other's books pretty much to see if the pages were in order and if there are any glaring coloring mistakes <laughs> and if the pages were numbered correctly. You would always just, like... I'm not saying you couldn't enjoy the stories anymore, but your interest changed. You just started flipping through them for technical things because that was your work day. And that's what you thought about all day. Gosh, you know, I really want these pages to be printed in the right order. <laughs> I still love comics. I can still sit down with a comic. I probably read too much old stuff and not enough new stuff, but I read new stuff. And it's a little different when you're working on them because if you pick up a comic book and it's not very good, you're really scornful. And if you pick up a comic and it's really good, you're just jealous. So it changes it. It's sort of related to if you're a writer, particularly, um, nothing hurts like seeing a friend succeed. <laughs> Hello, my babies. I am the adorable Eva Lab. This is Titular Characters. And in this issue, we're featuring the legendary Tom Pyre. Tom has been in the comics business for 30 years. He's written such books as Legion of Superheroes, Power Man, and Batman 66, as well as working as the assistant editor on Sandman and other Vertigo titles for DC. Today, he's the editor and chief of Ahoy Comics. And we're going to talk to him about comics. How are you, Tom? I'm great today, thanks. How are you, Eva? I'm loving life. You know, um, I have just been having so much fun, just in general. My, my people on Twitter are just the best people in the world, and there's just been so much positivity everywhere, and I'm loving every second of it. Cool. Cool. Yeah, you do seem to have a nice group there. We sent out a question to them and got a lot of response. Oh, yeah, it was great. And uh, they're, they're responding. There, there seem to be more of them every week when we do this. Cool. It's neat. So uh, I wanted to thank you again for coming on my humble little podcast. And I wanted to uh, ask you some questions about where you've been and the exciting stuff we're working on. Sure, and I appreciate you having me on. For you, where do you think your love of comics began? Oh, it was when I was little, they used to show reruns of Superman every afternoon on TV. And just about everybody who got into comics who's around my age, which is grossly advanced my age, just about all of us really initially got turned on by the Superman TV show with George Reeves and... It was just, I remember if you're exposed to that at an early enough age, it's like, it's just dazzling. Every time he's on screen, you just drop your popsicle or whatever it is. And just your mouth is slack jawed and you just stare at Superman. So that led to the comic books, which were quite different. And by the time I was maybe seven or eight, I was just a full fledged comic book addict. What were your favorite titles as a kid? Well, I loved. I love Superman, obviously. And when I started reading, Batman comics were terrible, but then they got good, so I got into those. And I loved Spider-Man. Spider-Man would um, punch somebody and say a joke, and I would like laugh out loud. I was like Bart Simpson reading Radioactive Man, if that's not too ancient a reference. But, um, I get that. Yeah, yeah. So I, just, it's, it's, so I, I was there really early on for Marvel Comics. So I got to watch them sort of grow from this mom and pop company to this world dominating octopus with my own eyes. Early on, the comics were so, 
they were a lot simpler. They were really good in context of everything else that was coming out. And Stan had this real like, disc jockey patter on the text pages and stuff. And he really, I think he had like an intuition that a lot of like devoted comic fans were lonely. So his sort of sales pitch was that he was our pal <laughs> and it really worked. So what was your first professional experience in the industry? Well, I started late. I was like a late bloomer in terms of mainstream comics or big time comics sort of. But uh, I had a, um, I liked to draw back then. And I had a comic strip. I, when I, I sold a comic strip to the local alternative weekly. And I did that for about 12 years. And that actually opened doors for me over time. It took a long time, but it did. It got me in with uh, Roger Stern, who was the great Marvel and DC writer who lived nearby. And we became friends. And he actually sort of helped grease my way into, the, into my first jobs writing at DC and then getting hired as Karen Berger's assistant editor. And Karen's the editor who started Vertigo. And uh, so we were a couple of years off from that, but we were already working on things like Sandman and Swamp Thing and Hellblazer. So, but I was, I was, you know, old for my age <laughs> when I started, when she hired me, I was probably mm, 35. So that was when I broke in. I was older than her. <laughs> it was weird. But you said, so you've aged backwards since then because you're 30 now. Now I'm 30, so I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> I have to do with comic books, I'm really sure. It, it my oh, secret, I still read the same comic books I read when I was a child. I just pull them out and read them again constantly. Nice. So you uh, worked on some really exciting stuff at DC, The Sandman and uh, Animal Man. I mean, these are like seminal titles. I learned so much about comics and about writing in my first year or two. At DC, the first year I shared an office with Karen, who knows everything. So I was able to just absorb a lot of what she knows by osmosis and listen to her, listen to the way she talked to the writers and artists on the phone. And it was so educational. And also I'm reading and working on scripts from Peter Milligan and Jamie Delano and Grant Morrison and Neil Gaiman. And uh, what an education that was. I would be a lot less literate if I hadn't had that experience, I think. Okay, so am I being presumptuous in uh, assuming that you started Ahoy Comics? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, three of us did. Three friends. We're in Syracuse, New York. My friend Hart Seely is, uh, used to be a newspaper reporter. And my friend Frank Camuso used to be a political cartoonist for the same daily newspaper here. and. Hart, in retirement, wanted to do something. Uh, I hope he's not kicking himself too bad, but he wanted to do something. He wanted a project. And he was able to find some backing and just offered us this chance. Do we want to work on a comic book company? Because Frank and I are both like so majorly into comics. Hart wasn't really, although he loved them as a kid. So... Um, he gave us this opportunity and we just, if we'd known how hard it was going to be, we might not have done it, but I'm, we're all really glad we did it. We're all like grateful for whatever shreds of ignorance we had. So that was January of 2017. I think something really big was happening in the world then that we wanted to stop thinking about like four years ago this January, if you catch my drift. <laughs> Yeah, I feel you. I personally breathed a huge sigh of relief the minute the Trump era was over. Yeah, I, and I, I think a lot of it, it came from heart, and I think really a lot of it was, we just, it just provided a blessed something else to think about for us, something big. But I'm really grateful that we did it, and I'm really grateful, you know, for the opportunity. It's just been I hadn't edited in years and I'd forgotten how much I liked it. And um, I got to just sort of rekindle relationships with people I worked with years ago, like Peter Milligan, who's writing for us. He has a book that's coming out now called Happy Hour. 
with Michael Montanat and, mm-hmm. and just new collaborators and new friends and stuff. Paul Constant is a great writer for us. Another old pal is Stuart Moore, who's very heavily involved in the company. And Karen hired me and Stuart just weeks apart. So we've known each other forever from working at Vertigo. You know, I love just how charming Ahoy and the Ahoy brand are. Thanks. So like this funny thing happens when I visit the Ahoy website. I show up every couple of months and every time I'm there on the history page, Ahoy is an acronym, but it always means something else. It keeps changing. It was originally an acronym. Would, do I have any language restrictions on here? <laughs> no, none whatsoever. Okay. Well, it stands for Asshole of the Year, which is an annual poll that Hart used to take and still does, actually. But in his college and post-college days, it was always a big party around the holidays. He would just have like a zillion people at his house and, and pens and paper and calculators, and we would elect the asshole of the year. And it was, you know, it, it, it couldn't be anybody local. It was, all, it was usually like a Republican president or something. But it's a tradition, I think. Well, it's been going on for a really, really long time. And uh, we do it now in kind of a reduced form. And this year we did it over Zoom. But that's what Hart and Frank and I were always pretty closely involved in the asshole of the year ballots and literature and all that stuff. So I think it was Frank said, we got to call this Ahoy Comics. And that's when we stopped talking about what to call it because we had to call it that because it's, uh, it was just this, <laughs> it was just this like through line of our friendship for all the decades we've, we've, we've been friends. That's a thing of beauty right there. <laughs> so, so Ahoy puts out so much interesting stuff. I, I think just in general, you guys are a relatively new company, but uh, the work you put out really feels like it has a, a sense of history to it, especially like uh, Wrong Earth, where, you know, as you flip through it, you've got these little mini stories that, you know, they, they look like they were done in the Golden Age and the Silver Age, and it's a real treat to read because it sort of fools your brain into thinking, oh, yeah, well, this has been around forever. I've always loved this. You know what I mean? Cool. That's a nice thing to hear. That's a nice thing to hear. When we when we started this, we sat down and just went through every comic book there ever was, looking for things that worked that people don't do anymore or didn't work that they could. And one of the things that really stood out is we started printing short fiction in the back because b- before letter pages, comic books always had these really awful little short stories in them because they had to, to qualify for cheap postal rates, because it wasn't enough to be a comic book. You had to have like text in there. So they would get, you know, they would spend as little money as possible to get someone to write a story as fast as possible. And that's, that's, there was one in every comic book. And we thought, what, what if, what if we did them, but they were good. (laughs) So we've been able to work with some really terrific writers and illustrators. And when you get in a white comic, you know, we hope the comic is in itself pretty substantial, but when you're done with it, there's going to be two or three short stories to read, or there might be poems, or we've even done a couple of crossword puzzles just to like uh, build a package out so you can spend some time with it. That's really neat. Just, just in general, the, the, the way they're structured, I haven't seen anything built quite like an Ahoy comic in a very long time. I, I want to say that there were a couple of companies that were doing similar things in like maybe, you know, 1980, circa 1981 to 1984. Um, hmm. but, but their stories weren't as good. Their production values weren't as high. And uh, they didn't have these just amazing artists. How did um, Ahoy manage to attract uh, such incredible talent? Well, we're, we've been very lucky on that score. We've <laughs> we've been able to work with some really wonderful people. And part of it is connections I'd made over the years, connections Stuart had made over the years, and Frank. And um, part of it is the fact that uh, it, 
I think we have a good reputation. We pay on time. If you're doing creative work for us and you have something, uh, an issue to raise, we'll listen to you. I think people like working with us and it gets around. So that's been a real priority for us that creators be treated fairly and that we all have a good time together because it's a comic book. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, it, it's got to be fun. Otherwise, you know, why be there? Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. And it's not, you know, it's work. It's not always going to be exactly fun, but it can be, as, you know, it, there's no excuse not to make it as pleasant as you can for people. So in addition to being a writer, you're also editing just a, a ridiculous number of books right now. I mean, I look at, you know, your, your, your output here, and it is a dramatic workload. How do you stay on top of it all? Well, that's quite a generous assumption that I do stay on top of it at all. But it, the stuff comes out, and uh, we're happy with it. And, you know, what am I going to do? I love comics. Plus, we're all stuck home now. So what else am I going to do? It's nice to have something to fill the days, frankly, <laughs> in our current right. situation. What does an editor do in a comic book? An editor sees it through the whole process, tries to keep people on schedule, critiques the work, makes it so that everyone's communicating who needs to be communicating. It's a great feeling to do it because you're involved with every step of the process. You're involved with coloring and lettering and everything. And proofreading. And, and I get... My flippant answer to that question, what does an editor do, is if somebody tries to kill the comic book, you have to kill them. <laughs> and it, it's, I almost completely mean that. <laughs> I bet. You're like the comic book's parent. That makes a lot of sense. Does it change the way you read and appreciate comics, like when you're reading for fun? It does, actually. It does. I remember when I was at D.C., when I was just was, like, first editing, and I was in a building with a bunch of other editors, and we were all like a gang of editors. And you'd look at each other's books pretty much to see if the pages were in order and if there were any glaring coloring mistakes <laughs> and if the pages were numbered correctly. You would always just, like... I'm not saying you couldn't enjoy the stories anymore, but your interest changed. You just started flipping through them for technical things because that was your work day. And that's what you thought about all day. Gosh, you know, I really want these pages to be printed in the right order. <laughs> I still love comics. I can still sit down with a comic. I probably read too much old stuff and not enough new stuff, but I read new stuff. And it's a little different when you're working on them because if you pick up a comic book and it's not very good, you're really scornful. And if you pick up a comic and it's really good, you're just jealous. So it changes it. It's sort of related to if you're a writer, particularly, um, nothing hurts like seeing a friend succeed. Some of the people uh, you work with at Ahoy are just the best in the business, masters of their craft. Um, do you ever find that you pick up things and learn by watching them work? You do learn. You always learn watching people be great. And I learned from my writers now. and I've been doing it for a long time. See, the, the good writers bring some of their own personality to it. So it's never going to be exactly like something somebody else would write. So you read like a Mark Russell script. You're going to pick up things you, you would pick up nowhere else because he's Mark. Yeah, Mark, Mark is amazing. I, I'm about halfway through Second Coming right now. It is just one of the most charming books I think I've read in years. But yeah. I keep saying that about Ahoy books, just in general. I don't mean to you know go too hard fangirling on you here, but I, I have not been excited about a, a new comic book company. When was when was the last time well, the last time I was really excited about one? Now comics in the '90s. I was really excited about them. They were doing some amazing stuff, like the Green Hornet. Then after that, I was excited about IDW when they popped up. But it's it's rare that it happens. And I just get that personal, you know, just excitement. Like, what's the next amazing, awesome thing uh, they're going to put out? 
I, I have to read it. And I, I hope that the people that listen to me under, under just understand how, uh, how freaking cool uh, the stuff Ahoy is doing is. That's really nice to hear. That's really nice to hear. Thank you. I'm honored. I'm honored. We try to, you know, we try to keep the standards high in production and art and color and writing and all that stuff. But what we try to do to set us apart is that every one of our books is, has to be on some level funny. They don't have to be comedies, but they have to be funny on some level. And that is like, it's a, it's, it's a way to just keep things entertaining and surprising a little. Sometimes you get so bogged down in like, for example, shared universe stuff that there are things you have, it, you always have to do that are more important than entertainment. <laughs> you know, these, these considerations come down where you can't, you, you might have to ditch an idea that's really entertaining because it disagrees with something that was in another comic book. And uh, so we, we have a company where that doesn't happen. We sort of designed it so that that doesn't happen. Get it up on, uh, on that time in the show. It's the fun part. <laughs> where, uh, I get to ask you about your, uh, your inner superhero. What does oh, your do you... inner superhero look like? Well, well you got to have a cape, right? I mean, there are superheroes who don't have capes, but the question is, why don't they have capes? So you got to have a cape. And I think you need a mask, frankly, because, uh, because you want that double identity. You don't want people coming to you all hours of the day or night asking you to use your superpowers. So is it possible? You probably want some sort of animal association, but... Uh, I don't know what my inner superhero looks like because my inner superhero is inside and I can't see them. Is there a, uh, a particular power set that, uh, that you identify with just in general, something you'd pick yeah. if you just woke up in the morning, you know, and there you are in Metropolis ready to go. Mm -hmm. I've always, I might do this as a story, but you know, you always, you fantasize about flying, but I'm afraid of heights. Have there been any comic books about, People who get the power of flight, but they're afraid of heights. Occasionally, I, I have seen it pop up. Okay, I'm glad that's being covered because that's a flimsy thing to for me to have to come up with a series around. An Ultiman is learning the limits of his abilities in the series we're doing. But I think you know when I really think about like the way superheroes have affected me inside and. From an early age, Superman gave me this example of someone who has a tremendous amount of power and only uses it to help people who are weaker, and never in, in his own interests. And I always, I always, I just grew up understanding that. And I, I held America to that standard. And America, you know, lived up to it only rarely, if at all. But I think Superman, Superman really gave me my politics with this example of his. I don't, I don't know if he's the best to read, <laughs> but he, he's kind of my totem in a way. I think Spider-Man is probably the superhero perfected, but Superman is, I mean, none of them would exist without Superman. I mean, he hit me when I was really young and really impressionable, and I always carry him around. Right on. Yeah, my favorite uh, superhero growing up was, I, I had the uh, the big two. I had Spider-Man, who was my favorite, because uh, that was the one my dad read me, you know, in the cradle. You know, it was Spider-Man. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, after that, when I started reading them on my own, my next favorite, next to Spider-Man, was, uh, was definitely Superman. Superman in, uh, in the 90s, like uh, Man of Steel era. Yeah, the Triangle books. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Superman with a mullet, period. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's great. So, like, to your earlier point about Superman and being incorruptible, he doesn't abuse his power. He doesn't use it for selfish gains. Um, do you think you could live up to that example? I'm thinking about it right now, and I don't know if I could. <laughs> I mean, only use my power to 
protect the weak. Use it for good. Yeah. yeah use it for good. Well, it is, there is a reason they are fictional, <laughs> but they can be, Grant Morrison always talked about how originally gods, people designed gods not to be, not to worship them, but to provide examples to be imitated. And that's what superheroes can be to people. Grant continues. <laughs> you can look at Superman's kindness and, and try to model some of it yourself. Batman's dedication. And Grant really believes in that. And I kind of believe in it, that they're there if you want to use them. So that's why I like it when they do things besides <laughs> seek vengeance and mope around about how sad it is to be them. And I, I guess that's why I dislike some comics for that reason. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. that. That happens an awful lot. I mean, some titles are, are a lot more guilty than others. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and there are cycles. People go into it. Yeah. You know, you have times when everybody's sort of writing the same story or a variation of it. And, and that can lead to terrific stuff. And it can lead to stuff that, well, you know, that make you go, uh, when is this cycle going to end, please? <laughs> I don't think I would have put it that way, but that, that's beautiful. That, that's, that's very, very true. Yeah. Yeah. I also remind myself that I'm not the audience and they're not for me necessarily. And there, there's always going to be stuff I like and stuff I don't like. And the stuff I don't like has just as much a place. Well, that's fair. Because, you know, every comic is a comic somebody falls in love with for that, that first time. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. And that comics are so great that way. You can, if you're at the right age, I can hand you a terrible comic and you'll fall in love with it <laughs> for your whole life. That's so true. It's fun to pass this stuff on. You had a, uh, a really great question for the audience. Thanks. We got some great answers. Yeah, we did. And the question was, for a superhero comic to be good, and I don't mean... Very special issues, but uh, number five that you would still buy. Is it necessary for the heroes to use their powers and or fight the villains? And uh, we got, God, just a ton of them. I think we got almost like 30 answers on this one. And yeah. uh, we can go through some of them if you want to. Yeah, let's do that. Awesome. A nod hater. He is just amazing. He said, not at all. Make it a good and compelling story. Build on the characters and establish the settings. With comics, it's always more desirable for me when they present ideas over spectacle. Reading Golden Age issues, they're always called mystery men, not superheroes. I love those. <laughs> and Steve Myers said, Peter David makes this issue, which is essentially a talking heads, transcendent with details, character development, and a fun twist at the end. And that was uh, X Factor number 87. Mm -hmm. And then Avri said, character is everything. Powers are always far less interesting than uh, the hero and why they do what they do. So that's, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll Doug Kane, I'm sorry? There, seemed to, there seems to be a consensus. It seems like there, there's one building. And, I, 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 you know, I was kicking myself afterwards after I put this up because it was a yes or a no question. I was thinking, man, it would have been great if I would have added a poll to this one, you know, but you could get the answers that way too. That would well, have been fun. I think it would have been all one side. <laughs> yeah, probably. I, I was kicking myself a little because I asked, um, is it necessary for the heroes to use their powers and or fight villains? And I wonder what answers I would have gotten if I just cut it off at using their powers. Is it necessary for them to use their powers? Because I, I know it's not necessary to see them fighting villains all the time because that gets, that's like the least important part of a story now because you know they're going to win, right? But okay. I think I, I really like seeing heroes use their powers, even if there's no fight going on, because 
I just like seeing it. It's a great visual, and it's a pleasure to see them use their powers. And also, yeah. if they're not, if they're not going to use their powers, why are you writing about superheroes? Why can't you write this story about someone else? What about superheroes that don't necessarily have powers, like uh, say Batman theoretically? I think there's if 22 pages goes by and he hasn't even tried to climb a sheer wall, then then I'm a little disappointed, you know, <laughs> or, yeah. or you know, swing across the street or, or just, you know, something acrobatic. Come on, he's Batman. If it's, if it's just people talking, I'm, when it was a rare thing, I was ecstatic when I'd get a comic like that. It was just, they're standing around in costume talking, but it's not that rare a thing anymore. And I, I want to, I would like to, do a really good story about characters and their interactions, but also since it's a superhero comic, you know, let Spidey climb a wall. Yeah, yeah, he'd, he'd sort of have to. I mean, otherwise, why is he Spider-Man to begin with? Right. Why? Why isn't it a story about Harry Osborn? Oh, or, that's true. You know, or Flash Thompson or somebody? Why is it about Peter if he can't, you know, do some good leaping? Okay, but by the same token, you know, Peter's marriage was interesting while, while he had it. You know, his, his life, his ups and downs, and yeah. all that stuff that's always getting in the way of him being Spider-Man. Well, did it? He was still Spider-Man all the time, wasn't he? He was still doing stuff. I guess, yeah. He still is. Yeah, I, I, I pick up a Flash comic. I like at least a little running in it. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> This has been a ton of fun, and I, I just wanted to thank you for coming by. Where can people find you on the internet? Well, Ahoy has a has a uh, Twitter feed called at Ahoy Comic Mags because we're magazines because we have fiction in the back. Oh yeah, cool. And I'm at Tom Pyer. It's T O M P E Y E R on Twitter. I'm mostly on Twitter. Facebook is boring. I get enough out, out of Twitter. I think, but Ahoy is on Instagram and Facebook and stuff, so, and I would direct you to those sites right now, but we gave each one of them a different name, <laughs> I can't think of what they all are, but I'll tweet it later. It's been a pleasure talking to you, too. It's nice to talk to people who really do love comic books. Wasn't that great? I just want to close the show by thinking the most important person in the universe that's you. You're adorable, beautiful, and unique. I see you. Thanks for listening to our happy little show. We couldn't do this without you and your downloads. Thanks. Pitch for Characters is a mountain located in the south end of Death Valley National Park, near the border of the Fort Irwin Military Reservation in San Bernardino County, California. <laughs> Just kidding. It's a podcast. It's produced and hosted by Eva Webb. Podcast art by Patrick Turla. Who's pretty neat. You should check him out on Twitter. Opening theme by Antonia Marquis. Closing theme by Mikey Flash of Speed Force Music. Sound editing services by Brogan Malloy. Special thanks to Hannah Batery. And that's it, babies. Join us next time for another exciting adventure in cyberspace. Love ya.